Welcome to another episode of Chax Chat. Join Chad Chilius and me, Dax Castro, where each week we wax poetic about document accessibility topics, tips, and the struggle of remediation and compliance. So sit back, grab your favorite mug of whatever, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Today's podcast is sponsored by the North Idaho College and the upcoming Pave the Way to Global Accessibility Awareness Day, or PWGAD, which is in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. PWGAD is on April 19th, 2023, and more information can be found by going to nic.edu slash PWGAAD. So we want to thank them for being our sponsor for today's podcast. My name is Chad Chilius. I'm an Adobe Certified Instructor, as well as Director of Training Solutions and Principal at Chax Training and Consulting. And my name is Dax Castor. I'm Director of Media Productions over here at Chax Training and Consulting. And Chad and I are both certified as Accessible Document Specialists by the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. And if you want to get your certification, head on over to accessibilityassociations.org, accessibilityassociation.org slash certifications and get yours today. Hey, Chad, we are uh, here in in person, right? Here we are we with are. video. It, it only took us, what, 80, 80 episodes to try yes, this out? <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I think we've kind of thought about it before, but it's <clears throat> always been such a scary premise because there's no like cutting, although we may cut this a little bit, um, but there's no real like, okay, stop, let's think about something, or did we really say this right and kind of go back and forth? Um, it's just, it's kind of live. I mean, it, it really is kind of uh, kind of here, which actually brings us to another point that we've kind of been toying with is the idea of actually doing the podcast live. And actually yeah. doing it like on StreamYard, on YouTube or something. And, uh, you know, so if you're interested, those of you who are watching this want to see us do it live on YouTube where you can maybe ask questions or, you know, kind of be a part of the show, um, leave us a, a, a message in the comments below wherever we po- posted this and um, we we may consider doing it. So, yeah, anyway. yeah. I mean, there's there's often a lot of opportunities to do it, right, Dax? I mean, you know, we're at, we're at a lot of different conferences and yeah. those could be really cool, you know, times to do a live podcast or something yeah. like that. Um, or, or right here in the, in, in the, you know, in, in our home environment too, yes. you know, that, that works out fine as well. Absolutely. So today we wanted to talk about, we have one topic to talk about. It is how do I know if my document's compliant? We hear this all the time. My document needs to be compliant. And my first answer is, well, what does that mean to you? Or my first question is, well, what does that mean to you? Because compliance yeah. is a whole different thing. And most of the time, Chad, what's the answer we get? How do we, when we ask someone, how do, how do you tell if your document's compliant? Right, right. And, and more often than not, the, the answer is, well, if it passes the Acrobat checker, we, we give it the blessing and we say that, that it's compliant. And, and you know what, Dax, I think it's worth noting too, to be fair, more often than not, I don't really hear people say, is my document compliant? I hear people say, is it accessible? Right. And that's another, another topic we wanted to, to kind of discuss, you know, agreed, today. agreed. Um, agreed. And, and, and they, 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 they can mean the same thing depending on what, you know, who's, who's asking the question or, 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 or who's uh, presenting that. But, um, but yeah, to your point, you know, we, we want to know, like, is our document compliant? You know, is it good to go or or can we pass it on to, to whomever and, and give it the blessing. And uh, a lot of times, you know, we end up having to prod a little bit, right. And and ask the client and we say, well, are you shooting for a particular standard? Right. Right. Well, Um, and that could be AODA for, for people in Canada or EN 301549 in the, in the, in the uh, European areas or section 508. Um, and, And what's interesting is a lot of people don't understand that all of those things really focus back on the web content accessibility guidelines, typically 2.0. 2.0. I know DDA, which is Australia, I think they're still 2.0, but most everywhere else is 2.1 A. And I, I, I feel like a lot of people think that they're all different. And there are some nuances, right? Like in, um, in EN301549, documents past a certain age in history 
are not required. Maps and historical documents are not required to be made accessible, which is unfortunate because I feel like there's a lot of history that could be. But I also understand the difficulty of trying to make some manuscript that was written in, you know, 1312 to, you know, to, to be accessible. Um, but yeah, there, there are some nuances that I think are, are, are interesting. Um, but again, it goes back to the difference between compliance and accessibility. Right. Mm -hmm. A good accessible user experience is one where you and I talk about this all the time. Testing with a screen reader is really the way to ensure that you have a good accessible document. The rules help us make sure we're following the process to make it compliant, to make sure that screen readers can understand it. And, you know, our last episode we just recorded for last week was on the ISO standard, ISO 32,000, which gives you a lot of that technical thing. But so what are some of the ways, so what are some of the, the checkpoints that you think make a good accessible document, Chad? Right. And, um, and I'm going to answer your question, but I also wanted to, to kind of state that a document can be accessible without being compliant. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and so, so what, you know, yeah, right. And vice you know, versa what, though, but, but vice versa oh, uh, as well. And, you yeah. Can pass 100%. A, pass yeah. a checker. You can pass pack, you can pass Acrobat and still not be accessible. And, you know, you and I were talking about uh, this org chart that, that we had, that you had um, last week and how, how to think about that user experience. And, and you and yeah. I might actually, you know, we're, we're toying with the idea of actually doing a webinar on this type of org chart, because really, again, user experience dictates everything and your yeah. approach to it and everything else. So compliance, passing a checker and user experience can all be very different things. Absolutely. So, you know, as far as like, you know, what, what do I do? Right. Like, and, and so, you know, again, you know, your approach and my approach could be slightly different, but the, the, the rules that I live by when I'm making a document accessible, the, the one that just always sticks in my mind is WCAG info and relationships. Sure. Right. I think it's probably one of the most important, uh, success criterion that, that WCAG has, but, but, but I don't do it because of WCAG. I do it because it makes such a difference to the end user, yeah. right? You know, when I go through my document and I make sure that my text elements, if it's a heading, it's tagged as a heading, right? Um, if it's a, a figure, it's tagged as a figure and it contains alt text, right? Right. L like those are, those are like, you know, and, and, and I usually accomplish this when I'm walking the tags tree, right? Well, so, and, and for our mm -hmm. listeners what, that may not be familiar with that, explain what that is. Right. So walking the tags tree is a step that we perform after a PDF file has been created. And, and there's two primary goals of walking the tags tree. The first goal is to make sure that my tags are being read in the correct order. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, order is everything. And, and again, try not to go down a rabbit hole here, but tag order is the order in which JAWS and NVDA, arguably the two primary screen readers in use today, right? The, the tag order is what they use to determine the order in which that content is going to be read. Right. So as, as many of us know, I mean, it, it, you know, think about taking a document and just scrambling it all up. Right. And trying to read it and make sense of it if everything's out of order. It, it wouldn't make sense. So the tag order is, is paramount. And, and that's one of the things that we accomplish by walking the tags tree. I go down my tag order in, in Acrobat or whatever tool you're using. And I make sure that the order is the order in which that I want it to be. The second thing that walking the tags tree allows you to do is to make sure that content is tagged appropriately. Right. And, and so as I'm going from tag to tag and I come upon a heading in my document, a visual heading, if that tag is not tagged as a heading, well, that's that's a problem, isn't it, Dax? Right. Right. We're we're violating info and relationships, you know, the visually well, and the appropriate level of heading. 
I was working with a client this morning and they had this big giant text at the top of the page and it was tagged as an H3. But then the smaller text that was on the page was tagged as an H2. And I said, well, shouldn't that be an H1? And in fact, no, that was a subheading of something else uh, of, of the overall topic. And so I said, but that's a cognitive barrier because visually it's very clear that this is 36 point large all caps type. And the next heading on the page is 18 point all caps. I'm thinking that's heading level one and this is heading level two. And they're like, no, that's not really the case. And I'm like, okay, you might want to think about, <laughs> about changing that, you know, but you know, and you were talking about meaningful sequence, right? Which is the order in which the tags are online and that's success criteria 1.3.2 meaningful sequence, which is a level A requirement. It's a basic level. So we open up our tags, we put our cursor in the very top of that, and we just start moving down the tags tree to make sure that things appear in the order, the meaningful sequence, and that they're tagged appropriately, info and relationships. Um, so those two things, right, are the very first kind of markers for if my document is accessible. Yeah, it's kind of accessibility 101, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 for those that are not familiar, who may not be familiar, um, in Adobe Acrobat, when you highlight a tag, it also highlights the object on the page right. that is associated with the tag. A at least if you have the setting enabled, we, we get that question a lot, right? I was people just thinking like, the same thing. Yeah, I'm like, people are like, <laughs> people are like, all of a sudden it's not highlighting you know, what I'm doing in my document. And, and it's typically, and, and I mean this with all due respect, but it's typically user error. They, right. they inadvertently right clicked on it and, and went down and unchecked highlight content. Yep. And, and so now as they go through the tag tree, they can't see what that tag is associated with. So it's an easy fix, right? Just right click yeah. and say highlight content. And now everything's Good again. Exactly. In your, in Acrobat, you just pick any tag in the tags tree, right click on it and go to highlight content and you'll see it checked. It's at the very bottom, second one up from the bottom, but yeah, yeah. absolutely. Roll map, I think is the other one, which is right above it that says apply roll map to tags. People say, oh, my rope, my tags don't say heading level one anymore. They're all this stuff from the InDesign file. Like, yeah, turn on roll mapping. You'll be okay. Well, and, and not to segue, but but I literally ran into that today, Dax, where I was working in an InDesign file and the, the style name was number one, mm -hmm. main heading, mm. number two, subhead. <laughs> that breaks the roll map. Yeah. The roll map does not like when your style starts with a number. I, yeah. I, I just learned that today. It, wow. it was, it was something I wasn't expecting, but when I opened up the tags tree, it was all your standard tags name. And then all of a sudden it said one main heading. I'm like, wait right. a minute. That doesn't make any sense. So, um, but yeah, yeah stay so, away so, from, stay away from extra characters, guys, oh, yeah. numbers, funky symbols, hashtags, at symbols, all of that stuff. Listen to yeah. some of our previous podcasts. We talk about that stuff all the time. Just keep your, 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 your yeah. Paragraph style simple. So, so like uh, walking the tags tree, uh, me, as you said, meaningful sequence, right? And info and relationships. Yep. And, 1. And 3. Say, 1. Yep. 1.3.1 and 1.3.2, right? The first. Two. Yep. Yeah. Which are very, very important. And, and I would say, if you said, you know what? I'm not going to use a checker, but I am going to follow... 1.3.1 and 1.3.2, and I'm going to make sure that that aligns. Your document is going to be accessible at some level. You, I you, would say you're, you're, we always say no major barriers, right? That, that's I mean, a, your yeah, very yeah. first, your very first kind of of uh, milestone is: can I produce a document with no significant barriers? Right? Yeah, and and that's really it. Is all my content represented on the page? And is it in the right order? First two things. That's yeah. no significant barrier. That doesn't mean it's going to be a great user experience, but at least you're at the basic level. Yep. Yep. 
So, so those two steps alone, you know, I do it anymore. I do it without thinking. And I think you do the same thing. Like when, when somebody gives me a PDF file and they're like, Hey, can you check this for me? First thing I do walk to tags tree. Am I seeing headings? Am I seeing elements? Is it in the right order? All right, cool. Now let's dive a bit deeper and right. see what other issues that, that we need to be concerned with. And so I would say that the next thing, that like the next uh, low hanging fruit is if you have figures, do they contain alternate text? Yep. Right. Because without alternate text, there is no information to be had whatsoever. Right. You know, if you're you're highlighting a, a, a logo. Right. Or you're highlighting a picture of a person riding a bike. Right. The user is not going to know any of that without alternate text. So so that's really important. Well, and the checker is only going to check is alt text present or is it not? Yeah. I just opened a document the other day and it passed the checker. And then I went through and checked the alt text. And what did I see in the very first image? The alt text description was one XPY 42Q. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's the alt text for that image. So because Word will export sometimes with this garbledy gook as the thing, or it might even be the file path to that image. I've seen that as well. If we're being honest, you can put a space in the alt text for every image and they will all pass. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. and that's, you know, when you're mm-hmm. in Acrobat, what I what I tend to do is I go to the accessibility tools, right? To my tool, my toolbar, go to accessibility and I do set alternate text. And when I do that, what it does is it just picks every image in my document and it just cycles through. And I just click next, 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 and just read them briefly to make sure everybody's got alternate text. But be careful, you don't want to hit mark as decorative because that will screw up your tags tree. And we're not going to cover why that is today, but, yeah, but yeah. it's a bug within Acrobat and it, it creates a, a, a thing that shouldn't exist. So just use it to kind of cycle through your alt text and figure out, does it have meaningful alt text or do I need to edit it? And that's a really good tip, Dax, because I've been approached by many clients who as part of their workflow, it's somebody's job to evaluate the alt text for all of the images. Right. To, to verify that the, that, the, that the images contain meaningful alternate text. And they're like, how do I do that? You know, and, and yep. some people have discovered that if you hover your mouse <laughs> over the image, you get a little yellow yes. box that pops up with the alternate text. And it's tiny. It's tiny yeah. and it's unpredictable because sometimes it doesn't work. Right. Um, but your technique that you just, uh, mentioned to everybody, the set alternate text tool inside of the Acrobat tool, it does a great job of just cycling through every image in your document. You can evaluate the alternate text. You could say thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever you want to do. And it's a really great, uh, tool inside of Adobe Acrobat. I love it. Uh, You know, and then the next thing from a workflow standpoint, after we've checked for info and relationships, we've checked for meaningful sequence, we've checked to see if our images have alt text. For me, the next step is, do my, does my text and my graphics have enough contrast? Are my headings, if they're colored or my, you know, sidebars that have backgrounds in them with white text or whatever, do those things meet minimum color contrast. And we use the tool, the tool that you and I use the most is the uh, T, uh, TPGI's color contrast analyzer. And if you don't know about that, just Google color contrast analyzer and it comes up as the, for the very first thing, I think. Um, but it's, that's going to tell me, I'm going to use that eyedropper for anything I find might be questionable to just ensure. Now you and I have been doing this a long time. We can look at text and I think I don't know about you, but for me, 90% of the time I can tell right off the bat if it's not going to pass. Um, yeah. but, uh, but, but that minimum color contrast is both a, you know, we often think of these, the, the checker as the, the, 
the litmus test for if a document's accessible, but there's a visual component to accessibility as well. Mm. And color contrast is for people who have low vision or who yeah. are colorblind and being able to make sure that my images, uh, my backgrounds or my fills have enough color contrast between the, the background and the foreground is really important. It's super important. Uh, although I, I do want to mention though, that if you're checking for color contrast in your PDF file, it's too late. Right. There's well, really nothing there. There's very little you can do to fix it at that point. You, you know? can, but it's definitely a, a, you know, edit. Anytime you touch edit PDF, it, tends to be a crapshoot and it's, there's many times where as soon as you touch something to try to recolor it it completely removes it from the tags tree so that's that's it's, been it's a, absolutely uh, yeah. pain and suffering i mean yes. it, it really is i mean so like like i i agree with you totally probably we should have put color contrast first thing you should do and you should do it in the source file before you spit out the pdf file Right, That's but you I and I recommend. both, you and I, I both know. know that we don't always get the source file. I mean, yeah, as designers, yeah. we, I think our our assumed position is we created the file. Now we're making a PDF. But for a lot of our listeners, they are so far removed from the creation of that document. By the time they get it, all they can do is flag it and say, eh. and and again accessibility at the end is always harder because then yeah. you've got to go back to your design team and say, hey. You didn't use a color a color contrast, uh, you know, palette that meets <clears throat> color contrast, or you're using colorblind color schemes, and so you know, again, it's got to all go back to to that that you know, kind of rethinking that whole process. And so, you know, in in previous podcasts, we've talked about third party tools, right? Right. And what I would say to people is, if you are in this boat where you are always working in existing PDF files, mm -hmm. right? You may want to take a look. There's two products that come to mind. One is called Lantana Cracker Jack, and the other one is called InFocus Pit Stop. Huh, okay. And both of them allow you to do a find and replace on colors in a PDF file. Wow, I did not yeah. know that. But that's a global yeah. thing or individual thing? Like, could Global. I say just on this page or the whole entire document? Uh, no, I think you can go only on this page or in the entire document. You can actually ah. do either or. So, um, yeah. Well, I will tell you that there is a plugin for PowerPoint. Now, this plugin, I've had it for quite a while. So I, and I tried the other day, I was on a different computer and I wanted to show someone the plugin and I couldn't, I went to their website and it wasn't offered for a uh, purchase, but it's called Smarter Format. And it is a plugin that allows you in a PowerPoint file to do global changes to a color, whether it's in a color palette or not. So I could take a template and say, oh, I don't want to use the red and green and brown colors. I want to change everything that was red to blue and 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 totally change it and it does it within a second i mean it's great but i couldn't find where it was online to actually purchase it but it's called smarter format it actually has smarter slides smarter organize and smarter format and each of them allow you to do different things to kind of tune your your powerpoint file but again it goes back to what you were saying globally change color again starting with a compliant color scheme is always the best way yeah whenever you're dealing with accessibility get your accessibility teams involved early on because the moment they can give you they can look at it and within just seconds say hey mm -hmm. this color just shift it this much and you're going to be fine and you know what? It's funny, Dax, how often that is the case Yeah. where like I'll check a color and I'll just start manipulating a little bit. I'm like, listen, this only has to be a tiny little bit darker to meet minimum color contrast. And, right. you know, I mean, sometimes the, the designer is is not happy about that. But, you know, um, you know, we, we, we should have looked at that, you know, a little bit earlier on in the process. Yeah. And in fact, that website is smarter-slides.com. I was looking okay. at it. So I, uh, but it's weird because if you click free download, um, oh no, there it is. 
and they give you the exe right there smarter slides download huh great. all right so i don't free. know if it's yeah it is free um wow. i think it's pc only though so sorry mac guys <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah, wah. all right so Very going good. back to what we were talking about earlier we kind of got it sidebarred there for a bit um so knowing if your document you know good workflow we've checked for info and relationships we've checked for meaningful sequence we've checked for alt text we've checked for color contrast right i think the next thing i check for is technical structure i'm looking at are my lists welded together do i have splits because sometimes what'll mm. happen is three items from a list item will get in one one l tag and three items from another sometimes i get tables that are broken apart that way or or that i'll go through and i'm looking in my tags tree for multiple h1s in a row multiple l's in a row multiple tables in a row all of those you know anytime you see the same tag except for a p tag you know over and over again in, in sequence in the tags tree that that requires further scrutiny wouldn't you say i yeah i would totally agree and along that same lines uh i would add to that paragraphs that are broken across a page right so where a, a paragraph begins on one page and ends on the second page but they're two separate paragraphs and, i always and what look would the, at that what would that how would that affect the user experience the barrier is that that the paragraph stops abruptly Right. So you can you can read the paragraph, but it's just going to stop at a random word. Now, again, you can, of course, continue reading from there, but it, it kind of stops at a, a, a random location when you're reading that content. It will well, and I think read. that goes back. To that, that goes back to how a person might digest a document, right? So for me, I'm using insert down arrow when I'm testing it with a screen reader. So it's going to pass right by that and it's just going to skip right over it. And it's just going to move on to the next piece. But if you were not reading uh, in auto flow format and right. you were just reading mm -hmm. element to element, you're right. It would definitely stop there and you'd have to hit the down arrow again. And we, we hear this all the time from people like I'm having to hit the down arrow a hundred times. Right. Yeah. And that's because it's going from element to element rather than the insert down arrow, which just does a, a, a reading kind of a, right. a read from this point forward. So, good, good and point. I would add tables to that because when tables span more than one page, again, you often have the header that's repeated on the second page. Right. Um, and, and I think it's word where it allows you to split across rows. So you'll exactly. have the, a row yeah. will actually split. And so what happens is, is if you have content that fills up enough space to be on the page one and spill over to page two, but only in one column, then you'll have a blank column one, column two. And then half your content from column three on one, one row and the other half on the second row. And it makes a really bad user experience because it doesn't, it doesn't merge it. it. It doesn't understand. It treats them as two rows. Right. So, yeah. you know, everything we've been really talking about, Dax, is, is really about making a document accessible. And right. when, you, when you start using the word compliance, compliance is all about meeting a standard. Right, it's pass right? fail, so, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So whether it's WCAG, whether it's PDF UA, um, and again, terms are thrown around all the time. People will give me a file and say, can you make it ABA compliant? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, oh, and I know what they mean, right? But right. It's, not, it's not really like, you know, it's not really being used appropriately, but I understand what they mean. But um, uh, section 508, Right. Which is effectively right. WCAG. Right. Right. Um, and then if you get into HHS or Department of Veterans Affairs, there's little nuances to the WCAG standard that you have to be aware of, like table right. summaries and things like that. So, um, uh, yeah. The other one would be um, acronyms. So if you're Department of Veterans Affairs, acronyms, they they require all acronyms to be spelled out. So that's another another thing. And then they have some uh, minimum. Do, do you mean... Uh, in actual text or you mean in print, they need to be spelled out. Uh, no. And uh, for screen, for screen, for reader, screen reader users, yeah, okay. for every okay. use, for every use of an acronym, it has to be expanded text or, or actual text, whichever you want to use. 
And that's where a product like Common Look is invaluable. Oh, yeah. Right? Because we could do a search for the acronym yep. and say, when you find this, add actual text that just spells out the acronym. Right? Yep. I mean, I personally don't want to do that manually. I, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> somebody in our Facebook group was just talking about that very thing. They're like, if I want to make this word say something different, you know, expand this out, do I have to create, how do I do that? And I'm like, well, you have to highlight the text, then create a span tag mm. by selecting it out and, and saying create tag from selection. And then it splits it. You make the span tag, apply the actual text to the span tag. And like, do I have to do that for everyone? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. Or without, you can Without use, the help of, of yeah. a, of a, th yeah. a third party tool, yeah. right? For but sure. So, so we have these automated checks, right? And Acrobat will use some of the PDF UA checks, many of the WCAG checks, but not all of all the checks that it can, that are part of either of those standards. Now, PAC will use both. I have to be careful here um, and not go on a tangent, but. Um, PAC will use PDF UA as its base standard, but it now PAC 2021 has a tab for WCAG. But I've said this on many podcasts that that tab is 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 just mapping all the PDF UA standards to the WCAG label, so that when mm -hmm. you want to spit out that report that says my documents WCAG compliant, it gives you a nice thing. Um, but in essence, if you say, well, I don't need to know PDF UA, I just need to know WCAG. If you're using the pack checker, it's all PDF UA. Don't, don't be fooled. Right. I mean, sure. it, it just, sure. it is what it is, but that's fine. Yeah. I, I think it's a, a good, it's a more complete standard. And I think you have less options for error if you're using the pack checker, right? Well, and, and listen, I mean, the, the checkers call me out all the time, yeah. right? Like, like as, as good of a job I thought that I did, the, the checkers, because of the algorithm that they use, they can more easily identify areas where I misstepped. And, and yeah. you know, you and I say all the time, accessibility is a combination of automated and manual checks, right? right. And, and I mean, I always rely on checkers. Yep. Do I rely on them a hundred percent? No, because right. as, as we were just talking, just because it passes the checker, I'll still be walking the tags tree every because, time. Because again, like it could be all P tags. Yep. Or and all still THs. Passes the checker. Yeah. All THs yeah. on a table, right? Yeah. And and you know, we the one thing, the <clears throat> common look validator, right? Now, Chad, you've been using validator longer than I have. I use the common look product. I, because it helps me, it goes farther than just giving me the errors. It actually mm -hmm. helps me fix them each one. Um, but the validator not only checks for pass fail, but it also checks for warnings and mm -hmm. the warnings are the ones that are, it, it actually goes a step further where PAC will only give you, Hey, it passed or Hey, it didn't, but validator will tell you, Hey, here are some things you should look at and manually review and then walk you through those. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's really slick. Um, it, it tries to incorporate what we typically rely on a human to perform. Right. It tries to incorporate it, that into the checker. And I think that's really cool. You know, I, I think it's right. a great, a great thing to have. Um, but, you know, again, we were talking about this. Uh, I, I had an example today, Dax, where the scope for a table header was not properly defined. Uh -huh. And that is an absolute failure in, in pack and, and in the common look validator, what I realized, however, and I think you could probably speak to this when I read that table, the header was announced, mm. even though the scope was not defined the header in NVDA, it was announcing the header for the cell that I was reading. And I thought that was really interesting. Well, you know? because, because what CAG says that, in a regular table, columns and rows, it is assumed that the first row is the column header. Now, it doesn't assume the first column is a row header, but it does assume that that first row is column headers, column which is header. great if you have actual column headers in your table. But mm -hmm. if you only have row headers in your table, meaning that first column is just describing all the things to the right of it, you're kind of hosed 
because yeah. NVDA is going to read those top that first row as the column headers. Yeah. And, and, you know, in our discussion about, you know, accessibility versus compliance and, and all these things we're saying, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we're typically doing this work for a client. Yep. And what we need to do is convince the client that our document is accessible. Sure. And there's only so many ways in which we can do that. Right. Right. And one of the ways is by providing them with a passing report. Yeah. Right. Um, it, it's, uh, and I've tried this before where, where it, it didn't pass, but I'm like, oh, but it's okay. Right. The client's not buying it. you right. The, the, the client, you know, you're not going to convince your client that, that these errors are not important. Um, so all that well, being said, you know, as much as we, you know, you and I are, are, you know, big advocates of the user experience and, and, and accessibility, um, at the end of the day, we, we need something to convince our clients that yes, in fact, this document is accessible. Well, and of course the, the one thing that comes directly to mind, Chad, and it's one you wrote an article about. So color contrast in the PAC 2021 checker is got some bugs in it. And so when I'm trying to give a, a client a WCAG compliant report from PAC and there's white text or light text over top of images, or I've used an underline as a background, uh, kind of a, you know, kind of tricking it a bit, PAC will flag it as a failure, even though visually it is passing. So if you go to accessibilityunravel.com, at the top somewhere, I'll put a link to this article uh, and so that you guys can go check it out. But Chad does a really good job of explaining the, the different ways that it'll pass or fail for this color contrast. Chad, you want to talk about some of the basic findings? Yeah. And, and I mean, it, it, you know, when we say pass or fail, I mean, the, the problem we're running into is that there's a lot of, I don't know if you want to call it a false positive. Um, you know, you, you'll often get errors on elements and you're like, well, I know that that has sufficient contrast. Right. right. And, and I was able to talk to the guys who wrote, uh, the pack checker. And one of the, one of the current limitations is that the pack checker is, is looking for filled objects, right? So basically mm -hmm. shapes that have a fill to them. Right. But some of the techniques that we use and and I'm going <laughs> to I'm mainly talking about InDesign here just because of its design capabilities. But th there are methods that we use that uses a stroke to achieve the appearance instead of a fill. Right. And the the pack checker is not evaluating any strokes. So if you have white text on a, a black stroke, if you will, the pack checker thinks it's white on white, right? Because it completely ignores that stroke. And, and that's why, again, check out the article. Cause I go through a, a, a number of different variables. One of the ones that I think I'm, I'm going to update the article to include images because uh -huh. images notoriously fail. Um, you know, it'll just say, Oh, this doesn't meet minimum color contrast. And you're like, well, I checked it and it seems to have, but I think the problem is a pack checker can't look at the pixel values inside of that image. Right. Right. So. No, absolutely. And, um, uh, I'm going to link. So I, I just linked while we've been talking, I linked this article in the homepage. So if you go directly to the homepage and look in the little black bar, that's right, right below the main menu, you'll be able to see a link to the, um, to the color contrast. So guys, we talked, so we talked about all of the different points of how to make uh, your, how to figure out whether your document is compliant versus accessible, what that all means. We talked about meaningful sequence, info and relationships, alt text, color contrast. Um, you know, there are other things that make a document accessible. Bookmarks would be another thing. You know, multiple ways, the WCAG principle for multiple ways, so it says that there should be multiple ways for you to navigate through your document. Now, if your document has heading structure, that's one. If you have a TOC, 
that's two. If you have bookmarks, that's three. WCAG only requires two different ways for you to be able to, na to navigate a document um, to satisfy the requirement, but an accessible document, if you've got more than nine pages in your document, you really should have bookmarks. And I would suggest that even if you only have a couple of three, if you think bookmarks would be beneficial to someone in trying to, to get to the different parts of your document, there's nothing saying you can't have bookmarks for a document that has, you know, four or five pages, right? Right, right. Especially if you have a lot of headings, right? Yeah. I mean, it still makes it easy to to navigate that document. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so yeah, that, that was a really good point. I mean, you had said bookmarks, TOC, um, heading, heading levels. structure, yep. you know, I mean, and, and honestly, I mean, I, I definitely use TOC and heading structure for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, th th those are the methods that I prefer, you know what I mean? Just going from heading to heading makes yep. it really easy for me to, to kind of break apart that document and see what it's about. One thing we do not recommend <laughs> is putting a navigation bar at the top of every page because it is, first of all, it's not a web page. Second of all, you're going to create a ton of errors when it comes to untagged annotations. And I wish we had more time to go over what we're talking about, but maybe uh, go look at some other podcasts that we've done, listen to some of the other podcasts because we've addressed it a few times where it creates an untagged annotation error because it repeats and it forces the user to go through every one of those navigation elements before it gets to the main content. So definitely avoid that as a means of uh, navigating through your document. Unless you use our trick. Oh, they'll right? have to and listen to the podcast, the I other know, podcast right? to find out what the trick is. <laughs> right, Chad? All right, yep. Chad, take us home, buddy. All right, guys. Well, listen, thank you all for uh, tuning in today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video version of our podcast. Um, and, uh, we, we look forward to seeing you guys, uh, in, in the near future. So once again, we want to thank the North Idaho college and their upcoming pave the way to global accessibility awareness day or PW GAD, which is in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho on April 19th, 2023, which is an actually just the day after this podcast will air. So it's just tomorrow for them. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That, yeah. That's it's five days away or, you yeah. know, Whenever this we'll is released, that so, <laughs> <laughs> at least as of the recording, it's five days away. So right, right. Um, so anyway, thank you guys. My name is Chad Chilius, and my name is Dax Castro. Where each week we unravel accessibility for you. Thanks, guys. That was fun. It was fun.